they were certified minority owned companies. So since March of 2020, we've awarded $88 million in contracts to New York State certified MWBN ease. And the message simply was just because it was a emergency declaration does not mean that M and W and DB firms should not apply. We had to change the way that we did business to be more inclusive. Right. And I, I do want to get to uh, what you just mentioned, Michael, which is the outside impact of the pandemic on black and black and Latinx folks. Before I do, anyone else want to weigh in on the last question or should we move, move ahead? I'll, I'll make a comment on the last question. Please, yeah. Um, first, uh, I am humbled uh, by the work that uh, our assembly people do and our state senators do, and also uh, by uh, the people that work in the agencies that are managers, that are executives, the Michael Gardner's, the Keith Wright's, um, the John L's, they, they do some amazing work on behalf of the community. And, and it's, it's hard stuff, it's complex stuff. Uh, they deal with a lot of issues and, 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 and they have to know so many things. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the other thing that I've, I've, I've come, and, and I say I'm humbled by it because the other thing is, is that I find out uh, they're so talented and um, and they're so intelligent, and and so uh, give you an example with regards to MBEs, we have to increase our uh, sophistication uh, when it comes to procurement and policy. Right? We, you know, I'm a registered lobbyist, uh, and I have to take uh, tests every year with regards to uh, procurement and policy, and all these policies that are created to help MWBEs. And, 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 and as Mike mentioned, we're in Black History Month. And, and uh, we started in uh, New York, uh, an organization called CBAC, the Council of Black Architecture Engineering um, Companies, the Council of Black Architecture Engineering Companies. And uh, I would say that uh, one of the panelists, uh, John L, was the one that recommended that we do that and that we organize so that, uh, you know, we get more involved in procurement, we get more involved in policy, and uh, instead of being reactive, uh, we begin to be more proactive. And uh, one of the things that I found out about our public servants, our legislatures, they're waiting for us to bring them ideas and, and things in which they can, uh, you know, take to their committees and possibly even become legislation. So they really want to hear about what our struggles are and, and the things that, it, that uh, you know, that could be helpful to us. And so I just want to say that as a, again, and, and I also have to say this, since we're talking about Black History Month, you know, the organization that I belong to, the CBAC, our members, how can I say, is um, we, we feel as though um, we're not getting enough work. We, we kind of feel like we're left out. We feel as though, um, have they forgotten us? Um, we're struggling. Um, and, um, you know, again, we're doing everything that we possibly can uh, to, to change that around. And, uh, and, and there's work that we have to do. And uh, again, there's work that we will go to the government for and the private sector, which, you know, let's not even talk about the private sector, about the opportunities that we have with the private sector. Is, is really bad, right? So, so we got to, um, how can I say, we have, to, we have to do our end of the, of the job. We have, to, um, we have to work as organizations, we have to organize, and, um, and we, we have to work to make things happen for the benefit of our black companies and our black community. And so uh, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Michael, I want to make sure we get your contact info to everybody because I 
the management. We might have some questions from firms about how to join CVAC. Okay. Um, Michael Sutton and Michael Garner, you both touched on this already, um, but we know that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on black and Latino people. There was a, a report from city comptroller's office in July that I believe 85% of firms uh, did not project lasting more than six months, surviving more than six months at that time um, of, MW, of, of MWBE firms. What, what can New York City and state, what can, what can other firms do to make sure that MWBE firms are, um, are able to stay afloat right now when we're in the middle of, uh, I think Michael Garner mentioned, a couple pandemics really. What, uh, what can we do to make sure that, that they're staying afloat? And I'll let whoever wants to start weigh in on that. Yeah, I'll just jump in. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Brian, you wanna go? You yep. can go. Also, I was gonna say from the accounting side, what we do and we're always telling the clients is they've gotta become as lean and as efficient as possible. But my colleagues here from the government side have just mentioned all the government programs that are out there. But if we're really gonna drive you know, capacity and drive ultimately to, you know, the sustainability so everybody is there. You know, colleagues here from Turner, and we heard just earlier from Gil Bain, there is a lot also out there in the private sector. And I think part of it is, is to make sure that the certified firms really expand on what they have for NAICS codes. Because when we're out there looking to attract bidders and people to participate, that's the first thing that we're looking at is to make sure so everybody gets credit on it. Yeah, I, th thank you. I, I just wanted to just, uh, again, piggyback on uh, on the question um, as it pertains to uh, Black firms and, and, and Hispanic firms um, and Latinx firms. I think, you know, what, what, what Michael said, I mean, is absolutely right, both Michaels. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, Black businesses twice as likely to close during COVID, a uh, New York Fed report came out with that, three times to be rejected by a bank uh, for funding, 40% of black businesses say their cash reserves are depleted. So when you're talking about how do we actually engage these businesses um, in the contracting opportunities, uh, we absolutely have to deal with the systemic issues that prevent them from engaging. And one of those things, uh, as I mentioned before, and I'll, I'll keep harping on it, is just the access to capital. That is number one. That's the number one thing. Um, and we, we're doing a lot to solve that, but that's a real, real issue for these firms. Um, and, and also the, the second uh, thing I think is, you know, it's really important what Michael talked about. Uh, and when you look at actual policy, uh, you know, he came to us a few years back uh, at, about a, uh, a particular issue we're having uh, with our pre-qualified list, uh, you know, selection of uh, firms that apply, they become on a pre-qualified list, and then you can actually uh, you know, have them utilize uh, for services. And he actually identified the issue and, and how it was um, hindering uh, firms from engaging by the requirements that were unnecessary and unrelated to the actual job itself. And we changed that. And, uh, you know, he, he did that. He came to us, he advocated. Uh, we sat down in, uh, in, uh, in City Hall and in 253 Broadway there where we were and had this discussion and was persistent and we went and changed the policy because he identified it was a challenge. And, and look, we want to make sure um, that, you know, firms know that we, they have access to us, but they also have a role to play as mentioned before. The other thing I will say is, as it pertains to black entrepreneurship, we also know this, that black owned firms in the city are growing four times faster than white owned firms. We know that black women in particular are the fastest growing demographic of small businesses in the country. Uh, but yet they only receive 0.02% of the uh, venture capital or VC dollars to establish their business. So there's a disconnect with talent uh, and there's a disconnect with the abil ability uh, of these firms to grow. We've got to change those systems. We've got to change those structures. And so what we did was we launched the Black Entrepreneurship NYC program in the city, one of its kind. We uh, have a $3.5 million investment in the Brooklyn Navy Yard to build out an accelerator for firms. Uh, we joined with Ernst & Young and Goldman Sachs and MasterCard to produce uh, really state-of-the-art programs for uh, Black-owned businesses in partnership with the city to really grow their uh, capacity and grow their opportunities to engage. And the last thing I'll say is on uh, emergency contracting. 
Uh, you know, we heard that again. Again, during the pandemic, the city has awarded up to $785 million in contracts and payments out to MWBEs. We know that you just cannot have an emergency and then dismiss all the MWBEs out there from participating. So the city did make some changes. The mayor signed those executive orders and we made the adjustment, but there's still more to be done. And we need firms to engage. We need them to come engage with us to engage in our programs so that they can be equipped to actually get these contracts and survive through this pandemic, but not just survive, but come out on the other side and thrive. All right, if I could just jump in from the, from the private sector piece, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do a better job of is communicating, right? Is, is, is having those touch points with our stable of MWBE firms that we deal with. We tried to make a concerted effort of that through the pandemic when the pandemic first started, making those phone calls, see how people are doing. Uh, you know, see if they've had to let go staff, see if they've had to cut back just because of the pandemic, because those are some of those early warning signs of where some of our partners uh, may be headed if, if, if they're not, um, you know, given uh, opportunities to, to, to stay afloat. The, I think the bigger thing, and you've heard it from our um, panelists that are working in the agency, you see all this great work that they've been doing, all these programs that we've put in place, you see the intentional action that has been put in place to break down those barriers to change laws, to change policy. Well, on the private sector side, those are some of the things that we are doing as well is that intentional action. Because one of the biggest things, right, the elephant in the room is there is still a stigma that exists that when you go award a contract to a minority or women business enterprise, it's a step down, right? You're compromising something, you're compromising quality, you're compromising performance, right? That is still a stigma that exist within our industry and in larger part within our society, that if I'm going to a minority business, I'm compromising something, I'm getting less, right? So one of the things that we in turn do, the best thing that we can do either in this space of COVID and even beyond is continue to advocate for our minority and women business uh, partners, right? Give Get our clientele, get everyone in the mindset that this isn't a, a step down, this isn't some type of, um, uh, you, have, you don't have to relax the criteria or your standards in order to provide these opportunities to these minority and women businesses because they're more than capable and they have the opportunity. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the programs on the city level, even in the private sector. At Turner, we have an advanced payment program to try to look to see if making sure that we can uh, pay our uh, firms on time or even ahead of when we are paid from our clients. Again, in creative ways in which we can look to uh, try to make sure that our firms are staying afloat. And Commissioner Doris touched on this point earlier, and you've heard it from Mr. Garner throughout his uh, conversation, is the thinking outside the box, right? Coming up with new ingenuitive ways, uh, and, you know, employing different strategies to maintain our businesses and keep those businesses afloat. One of the things that we've done both here in New York and even nationally is look to joint venture with minority and women businesses, right? Because an agency, a uh, private sector client, uh, obviously they know the brand, they know the name of Turner. Now if we can partner and we can uh, JV with minority and women business and business enterprises, it gives them the exposure on some of those larger projects. Uh, in Chicago, we're doing that with the Obama Presidential Center, right? We have a 49% stake within that project and then 51% of it is allocated to multiple minority businesses on that job. Uh, here locally in New York, we had a, a, a project in the Hudson Yards area for, for Ernst & Young. And there was certain minority and women business enterprises criteria that was laid out for that project. But we far exceeded that by, be, by thinking about ways and how we can split packages, how we can strategically place minority businesses in the uh, most positive and optimal situation for them. So uh, I think communication is key. We, we have to know where you stand. We have to know that if you're in trouble and you're, and you're raising that hand and hopefully you do it with enough time for us to actually be able to step in and do some things and actually help you recover as opposed to, you know, when, you know, the proverbial lights are getting ready to go out so we can uh, be proactive in providing some of those, some of that assistance uh, to make sure our partners, you know, emphasis on the word partners, they making sure our partners uh, stay in business and stay productive. And, 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 and Annie, Annie, if I, if in 2021, if I hear anybody uh, say that minority and women uh, do not have what it takes uh, in order to compete 
and winning contracts, um, they have a problem on their hands. You know, that's, that's like going back to, to baseball. In 1947, Jackie Robinson um, was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Did that mean that Jackie Robinson did not have the talent to play before 1947? No. It was, he, he was banned from playing in Major League Baseball because he was black. And so we got to uh, stop this conversation about the qualifications of certified minority owned businesses and women owned businesses because simply they have not had the opportunity. And so what, you, what you're seeing here with the Keith Wright and a Janelle uh, Doris, we change perception every day. We fight for our, our MWBEs um, internally and we are not going to accept no for an answer. We're spending taxpayers' monies and we're going to create opportunities for our M and W and DB firms. That's that's exactly right. And I and, and I would I would add on to that um, based on what Mr. Collins was saying um, about communication, so important, uh, relationship mapping. We heard that earlier, so important. But I, I also hear right now to what uh, Michael Gardner just said in the back of my head every day, I hear these words, the fierce urgency of now. And I don't have to tell anyone on this call where that's coming from. But when we think about COVID and we think about all of the crises that Michael laid out that we're, that we're facing, and we know full well that there's capability in the marketplace, then it's up to us to reveal uh, uh, that capability where it is and be able to make sure that our agencies and our companies are utilizing uh, that, that capability. I would also add to, to, uh, to Michael Sutton, uh, I, I think he, he undersold uh, CBAC just a little bit. And I would say that I think that is an excellent concept of those groups coming together. Uh, uh, more importantly, uh, them being able to say to all of us, we're here, we're ready, we're, 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 we're capable. And to, to, from our organization, we look to the leadership of CBEC when we have things that we're trying to work through because we understand uh, the collective uh, talent that's in that organization. And it's my hope that, that that's just the beginning, that there will be more uh, CBECs coming together so that we will see uh, a bigger, bigger uh, uh, prime opportunities of, uh, that will be awarded to uh, minority and women-owned businesses. So I applaud you on, on CBAC, uh, and I would just encourage you to keep telling your story. But my takeaway for this moment with COVID and all the things going uh, is that there is a fierce urgency of now. Uh, and, to, and to speak specifically to one of the things we, we did uh, in our agency was any resource that we thought could be helpful to uh, the MWBE community, we send that out to them. And it doesn't matter if it comes from Michael's organization or Commissioner uh, 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 Janelle's organization. If we find information anywhere that is helpful to uh, the MWBE community, we package it and we send it out to everyone on our, our mailing list. Here's who's making opportunities here. Here's who's uh, uh, providing capital. Here's who's doing uh, uh, upcoming training. Here's what we're doing at the Port Authority. And so we just br we broke through the walls and said, our community is in trouble. Any way we can help get information and resources to them, we're, 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 we're going to do that because we, oh, we are in a crisis uh, uh, together. Uh, and so we can't use yesterday's tools to handle today's uh, challenges. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left and um, a lot of questions are in the Q&A box. Um, I want to get to at least one of them before we finish up here. And I'll just note that uh, the, the next panel, we can see, still see those questions. So hopefully we can get to others in the next panel. Um, one comment here, as a Harlem MWBE, None of these initiatives, policies, or funding have filtered down to local small businesses. Can you speak to any local businesses that have successfully benefited? Um, any success stories you can point to? Well, uh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Mike's, Mike's, Mike's office is, uh, is in Harlem, and, yeah. and, and, uh, and I live in Harlem. But let me just say that I think that Mike undervalued himself also because he left a, su a successful um, practice in Chicago came here and opened up shop. He's winning contracts, but what he didn't tell you was that he hired a lobbying firm 
to open doors for him. And so that was key and, and that was vital also as well. And so, yeah, so, so basically it is, it is our practice at the MTA. For example, we, we built a $214 million uh, bus depot in Harlem, 147th Street, Lenox Avenue, the Mother Claire Health Bus Depot. And what we did was that we wanted the contractor to not only build that project safely, timely, on budget, and inclusive of our MWB goals, but we wanted the neighborhood residents and the neighborhood businesses to benefit from that uh, project. And so the firm hired a local uh, security guard service firm. The firm also opened up accounts in, in the, the, the local hardware store. They gave free OSHA training and they called the unions and indicated that for every um, um, person who lives in Harlem by this zip code, can you give them preference from working for working on this job in Harlem? And the answer was yes, yes, yes. And so once again, our, our practice is to make sure that any project that we build, that the local residents and the neighborhood, they will benefit from that taxpayer driven capital construction project. Can I just Thank add you. quickly, just yeah. real two, 20 seconds. Um, so we have, and I, I hope he's on, uh, you know, James Peterson, uh, who uh, from Eat is his, his company of his catering, catering company. Uh, I think he won about $17 million or so uh, for food insecure, uh, for the insecure, uh, food insecure in the city through our program here in the city. We worked with him throughout the years, part of our mentor programs, part of our, 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 our work here at the city. And I just want to give him a shout out. Uh, so again, and he also went to the local restaurants in Harlem and utilized them as part of the resource to help us during this pandemic to get food to those who are in need. I want to give him a shout out. He's a fantastic vendor and doing great work. SBS, we've helped, you know, we have 110,000 services we've given out to small businesses in the city. Uh, you know, webinars with 50,000 plus. We have a, a, a hotline, 55,000 businesses have called in. We've helped them, uh, pushed out $125 million to small businesses, and the list goes on. I mean, we, we, we certainly are, are hitting the ground small business. If you're a small business and you need help, you can call us at 888-SBS uh, or NYC, and we will definitely help you or go to our website, nyc.gov forward slash SBS. Thank you. Yeah. Annie, Annie, Annie gonna, let me just, just, just end by saying, I'm, I'm, in, seconds. Yeah, I'm, I'm in by saying this, that, that Keith Wright and Mike Messiah and I, we work together and John L and I, we talk uh, at least two or three times a week. As a matter of fact, we just saved a company who took his license to, be, to, to become certified or not. He was going to lose $22 million in contract, made a phone call to John L. The firm got their license and they were recertified. By the, by the MTA. Thank you, John L. We got a lot of love for James Peterson here in the chat. Um, sure. thank, you, thank you to all of our panelists. Thanks, I Mike. really appreciate, and I'm sorry we have to wrap this up. There's a lot to talk about, but I wanna thank you for, uh, for your insight on what's gonna work for MWBE firms and on highlighting the work that lies ahead. So thank you all for participating and I will uh, hand it over to Ralph Ortega for the last panel now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, and thank you all for that really wonderful discussion. Uh, next, let me welcome our last panel, uh, Diversity in New York, and our moderator, Cheryl Huggins Solomon, Chief Communications Officer at the NYU McSilver Institute for po uh, Poverty, Policy, and Research, who will be introducing the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, that was an amazing panel. Uh, um, the whole summit has been, but the previous one uh, really had me wrapped. So um, it's a great act to follow up. But in this panel, we're going to be focusing specifically on um, diversity in workforce development in New York and why it's so crucial to the city's post COVID-19 recovery. And uh, my apologies if you hear a little bit of knocking and pinging. Um, construction unexpectedly happens sometimes when you work from home during a pandemic. So um, I apologize in advance, but I will try to stay on mute when I'm not speaking. Um, but anyway, so this panel is going to be a natural segue from the previous conversation since equity and business development and workforce development go hand in hand. So we're gonna talk about the opportunities, the challenges, and how you can be part of the solution. 
And when I talk about diversity and inclusion, I always want equity to be a part of that conversation. And so we're going to be um, making sure that we talk about that um, because um, people, um, women, people of color, people from marginalized communities, we all deserve to be a part of the workforce and especially the recovery. Now, as the New York Times reports, women have borne the brunt of the pandemic's effects on employment and childcare resources and are disproportionately among those who dropped out of the workforce last year, and particularly uh, Latinx women. And we also know that according to a report by the Comptroller's Office, nearly one in four New Yorkers of color wound up losing their jobs at one point last year during the pandemic, um, and the recovery has been very slow. And that was 10 percentage points higher than what white New Yorkers experienced. And that was on top of prior racial and gender inequities in employment and wages. Uh, for instance, according to a report last year by the Center for an Urban uh, Future, Black people make up 21% of the overall workforce, 22% of the overall population, but less than 10% of those in well-paying jobs, uh, the kind where you might get to work from home. Um, such as advertising, the securities industry, publishing, computer systems design, and motion pictures and video. And only 13% of legal services and 16% in construction, again, compared to being 21% of the workforce. And as you heard in the prior panels, businesses owned by people of color, women, and other mar marginalized communities are also in danger of getting left behind. So this affects job creation in these communities. It all goes hand in hand. So the experts gathered for this will tell you how that, what they are doing to increase diversity in our city's workforce, how supplier diversity goes hand in hand with that. And with that, they are, and please turn on your cameras, um, Don Pinnock, who is Executive Deputy Commissioner for People Operations at the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services. She maintains citywide oversight of services provided to HR, equal employment, diversity and inclusion uh, departments at every agency. Then we have Matilda Roman, who is Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals. She leads, designs, and directs diversity, equity, and inclusion integration strategies and solutions for the largest municipal health care delivery system in the country. We have Holly Martinez, who is Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at T-Mobile. And she is the company's first executive in that role and is fervently committed to sustaining an inclusive workplace where all employees can thrive. Uh, B. Alway is the Senior People Growth Manager for Women and Underrepresented Talent Development at DoorDash, focused on connecting these populations to the innovation economy. And Kristen Mollick is the Director of Business Diversity at CDW, where she drives the information technology company strategies to achieve supplier diversity objectives. So let's jump right in for the first question. And Please, um, and I'll call on you one by one, um, but please let us know how your office advances diversity and inclusion in New York City's workforce. And this is an important part. Please also talk about how you quantifiably measure success in your work. And I will first ask Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock. Good afternoon, thank you everyone. Um, so we advance uh, diversity and inclusion in a host of ways. Um, as you mentioned, we essentially provide um, support, technical assistance, guidance, training, and oversight to the nearly 80 agencies that report to the mayor of New York. And so in doing that work, a lot of our work really centers around ongoing engagement, education, and communication. And so with that, we provide uh, very specific training around how to use workforce data and then address underrepresentation. So in the city of New York, we have a little over 2000 titles, which sounds unmanageable. And frankly, it can feel that way at times, but we do have workforce data at our fingertips and we provide direct guidance and training on how to best use that information to really drill down to those key areas where we should be creating a more diverse pipeline. 
So in addition to teaching um, agents how to use the data, creating inclusive recruitment plans, we also help them create a recruitment strategy so that we can plan for a pipeline into the future. Um, the city of New York is a civil service municipality, so which means that our system is test-based. So as you can imagine, um, we have to be extremely proactive as it relates to our communication and our recruitment strategies. Because in many instances, we need to market a job before it actually exists. So that's the reason why the data that we use is just so important. Um, additionally, we ensure compliance with any um, EEO um, or equity related laws to ensure that all of our agencies are really creating that level playing field in every aspect of their hiring process. In terms of how we measure success, um, we do that um, quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, certainly, we track um, the number of test takers we have at any given time. If our goal is to ensure that more women are applying for jobs, we look at that data. If we're looking to tap into um, specifically more Hispanic women, Black men in a particular job category, we track all of that data from the time that they apply for an exam until someone actually um, is selected for a job through civil service. But on a qualitative level, um, we certainly um, look at engagement. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening within the city that are really, really interesting right now, specifically talking about how you really create a diverse and inclusive workplace culture where we've provided training on unconscious bias, microaggressions. Um, we've started to um, establish task forces at different agencies where we're talking about race equity, really having those courageous yet uncomfortable conversations. Um, and so all of that goes hand in hand with creating a workplace that um, communities of color, women, um, those individuals who are underrepresented in the workforce would want to apply for and be a part of. Um, and let me ask you just a very quick follow-up. Um, so on a macro level, what is the workforce data, uh, the data that you're tracking um, telling you uh, about um, women in the workforce, um, people of color in the workforce uh, uh, and other marginalized communities? That's a great question. So definitely we see that more women and more members of the BIPOC community gravitate towards our social services. Um, and when you look at some of the salaries, specifically within those jobs, um, sometimes they're starting off at a lower floor. So in those particular areas, we're looking for opportunities um, around career advancement, how you actually teach someone how to navigate their civil service career. Um, conversely, we're seeing fewer women um, and members of the BIPOC community potentially applying for some of our uniform titles. And so there has been quite a bit of work that um, our uniform agencies have done to engage in recruitment strategies. And that's where our Office of Citywide Recruitment comes in. We have partnered with a host of agencies, whether it's um, Department of Transportation, where they're looking to hire more women, more people of color, Department of Buildings, where we work directly with them in creating inclusive recruitment strategies, and in some cases, marketing their jobs for them um, in order to really highlight the benefits of working within government and at that particular agency. Thank you so much for the Thank you. Insights. Um, I will now ask um, uh, Matilda Roman. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here in City of State and, and be among these distinguished colleagues to really have this conversation. Um, I think these conversations are needed more often than not, and, and having this panel is really indicative of of city and state's commitment to really bringing this conversation to the forefront. Um, here at Health and Hospitals, um, you know, we are the largest municipal healthcare system in the country, serving 1.1 million New Yorkers annually. Um, and as you all know, you know, we're in the midst of COVID uh, research um, and has provided a number of challenges for us. It really has amplified you know, the disparities and inequities that exist um, structurally um, and institutionally. Um, and so part of the work that I've done is kind of really kind of work with business partners across the system to really help kind of mitigate um, some of these systemic issues um, and help support and drive and advance diversity and inclusion across the system. And how we do this is through three things, to be looking always at workforce diversity, 
ensuring that our workforce reflects the patients in which we serve. Um, we serve, you know, the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. We are the safety net for the city of New York. Um, and so it's very important for the people that work in our system to look like the people that they're serving um, and connect with them in their lived experience. Um, we're looking at this from a workplace inclusion perspective and really kind of thinking through, you know, for, for us, how are we really making sure that we're creating an inclusive work environment for our colleagues and creating an environment where people feel like they belong and are respected and valued when they're coming to work. We're a very mission oriented organization. And so that the, 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 the people that come to work here are really guided by our mission. Um, and it's really cultivating uh, the tools and techniques and, and awareness to really ensure uh, that we're kind of creating a, a more inclusive environment for everyone in rank and file. And then the last thing I think that's really important distinct from many of the city agencies is that we're patient centered. And you know, much of the work that we do is really ensuring that we are customizing our services to meet the needs of our diverse communities in which we serve. Um, and that speaks to you know, language access, cultural competency, re you know, really building capacity for our frontline and healthcare professionals to really build their capacity to provide culturally competent and linguistically appropriate services. Um, and so that's some of the work that we do. And then segueing into the metrics, the metrics vary. Um, so we'll be talking about, you know, language services with respect to patient care, you know, the, the numbers of languages, our capacity to meet the needs of our linguistic, linguistic population is really at the forefront of ensuring that we are providing quality language services to br bridge those communications between providers and patients. When we're looking at you know, workforce diversity, we're looking at the numbers of our, you know, African American, Black, Latino, Hispanic, Asian, you know, Native American populations to make sure that we are, you know, keeping true to ensuring workforce diversity and that our workforce reflects the patients in which we serve. And when we're looking at inclusion, right, all the DNI indicators, whether it's embedded into our employee engagement, you know, surveys or other key things that we measure kind of the employee experience. We're always looking and trying to use the equity lens to think about how we're measuring success and how we're, we're trying to figure out how we move and progress in this space. Thank you. And, and I wanna dive a little bit more into the COVID uh, challenges in a moment. Um, but um, right now I would like to ask um, Kristen Malik if she can um, talk about how her role is advancing diversity and inclusion in the workforce. Of course, and good afternoon. And thank you so much to my colleagues and of course city and state um, for always providing relevant content, meaningful conversations and of course, be a good partner to CDW. So, you know, my role at CDW as the Director of Business Diversity um, is really to ensure that the supply chain is one of equity, one of equality, and one that's diverse. So, you know, where I sit and the, the goals and, and what I'm accountable for in the city and state are to ensure that when we are serving our 365 clients and agencies in the city that we are bringing the NWBE community with us, the innovators, the startups, the entrepreneurs, and how the multiplier effect really comes to life here. So if you think about workplace, workforce, and supply chain, they can no longer be siloed, right? We can't have a, a workplace that's diverse and a workforce, you know, that's of culture and acceptance and then not procure or not spend money or invest with the MWB community. I think we've heard that loud and clear from the two prior panels. It absolutely matters where we spend money because money does matter, right? Money matters if the doors are open. And so, you know, where our, our footprint is, is, you know, the well over $100 million directly spent with MWBEs to serve New York City, especially in healthcare and education, working on the digital divide side by side is ensuring that the MWB communities that are historically sidelined are not, right? We are not in the business of competing with MWBs, we are in the business of collaborating. And when we collaborate and we equal the playing field, think about, again, that multiplier effect, now those communities, those moms and dads are going back to work. 
for so long, we did these school supply drives. You can think before COVID, right? Where we would buy pencils, donate a pencil, right? Because there was a group of students that might go back to school without school supplies. And we all did that. Well, and then COVID hit and now all of a sudden it was pressure to get, to get Chromebooks to students. The most important number to a student didn't become a test score. It became what zip code they lived in if they were going to see their teacher. And so we have to be honest about making sure that if we want to have a diverse workforce, we have to ensure the communities in which those students live today, that their parents have an opportunity to, to have meaningful jobs so that they can send their kids to higher education. And then thus we will have greater workforce diversity. We will have more college graduates coming out of diverse communities in, in populations. I think though, we have to always think about, they can't be siloed, workforce, workplace, and supply chain. It, it's all one. And that's probably the biggest intersection that, that we have an anchor on at CDW. So we measure success in a variety of ways. We're constantly measuring our job creation. Supplier diversity, I think, can habitually be thought of like a spend initiative, right? What's the spend? What's the percentage? And those are landmarks for success. But if we can challenge ourselves to not be focused on a spend initiative, because we won't spend our way to justice, we might all want that, but we can't spend our way to justice. What we can do is have growth initiatives, economic growth initiatives that are focused on jobs. So if we're spending $100 million with MWB communities, we have to understand that those, be accountable, I should say, that, that those dollars are creating jobs to enhance the workforce for generations to come. And so that's what we measure. We do track spend and we're held accountable to the goals that we kind of heard from the other panels. Um, and it's not a number to hit for, at all. It's, it's to ensure that um, the multiplier effect stays present because the workforce um, you know, can't be sidelined, the supply chain can't be sidelined ever again. So that multiplier effect is important, um, but when you talk about spend, you mentioned 100 million. Is, is, is that the number uh, at CDW or is, um, um, what are the numbers that you're tracking there? Yeah, absolutely. So we hold a number of contracts in the city and state and, and there are, as we heard probably in the first panel, there's 20% contractual goals, aspirational 30% contractual goals. So. We, you know, we don't look at those. I think it was noted, it's not a compromise when we never ask for a pass. We won't ever find that or, but so we do track uh, what we're contractually obligated to, right? That's just probably best practice and standard. Um, but when we talk about hundreds of millions of dollars that we're, we're spending with New York City's MWBEs, you know, that is intentional spend. That means that when we are, we're procuring for for uh, an agency, for the mayor's office, that we're bringing an MWB with us. And we track that spend, but making sure that it's not just spend, that we can use third party validation and Department of Labor to ensure that we're tracking to jobs. So we do track spend, we try to track our job creation as close as we can to make sure that we're moving from just procurement to meaningful procurement and sourcing to impactful sourcing. So that's where we believe jobs can be created. Thank you. And, and uh, Holly Martinez? Yes. And so the question is um, your position, uh, how is it um, uh, contributing to diversity and inclusion in New York's workforce? Happy to talk about that. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and one thing I think um, that is so impactful about being here with each of you is that as a practitioner, we have our heads in the work all the time. And so to lift your head up and connect with others who are doing this, it's just incredibly inspirational for me to hear what others are doing. So thank you for having me. And I, I really appreciate and I'm learning from the other panelists as well. So um, in order to talk about what we're doing as a company, it's, you can't, I can't talk about it and separate the fact that we just went through a major merger with Sprint. And so as a new Fortune 40 company, we've had to um, really take stock of who do we wanna be from a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a new company. And so we took a step back and evaluated 
how do we want to leverage all of these new resources that we have as a combined company? So the first step that we did is take a, a deep look across the entire organization, every aspect of how we do business from the lens of DE&I. So we took a look at how are we um, interacting with our employees, our customers, our suppliers, our partners, our communities, and how are we showing up? So what's important about this is that it's a broad stroke look at every aspect of how we are doing business from an equity lens. And from there, we're able to understand what are the pain points and opportunities that we have as a new company to lean in and understanding what the new reality is as a company so we can leverage it. So, um, you know, one of the things that we did, and I can speak a little bit to specifically New York, through the process of evaluating who we want to be, we have established a, an external diversity council. So we have deep partnerships with the National Urban League, uh, the New York Urban, Urban League. Mark Morial is the chairman of our uh, diversity council. We also have Al Sharpton, who represents, of course, the National Action Network, and he's on our council. We also partner closely with Somos, who represents the Hispanic population in New York State. So we're looking at those partners who can help us specifically in New York, but also national partners that we can um, work on uh, deepening those relationships and making sure that we're bringing equity into every aspect of our of our business. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit with that external counsel? Um, can you talk about specific things that uh, perhaps that they have um, suggested or pushed you to do? I love this. You know, I, I love the fact that, um, first of all, Mark is, is such a tremendous partner and he's a great partner to, to me in this work. And one of the things that we've done is we've evaluated, you know, the new diversity strategy that we're putting forth as an organization. We've done some deep dives into the work and programming that I can, I can talk about a little bit later and talk through some of the specific initiatives that we're developing. So the, the council has been a great partner and sounding board as we have looked at how we build our, our strategy and the, the different work that we want to build in our workforce pipelines, et cetera. So they've just been really good partners. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to talk about pipeline development. So okay. um, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask BLA now if you can talk about DoorDash and, and your role in promoting um, diversity and inclusion in our workforce. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm just in awe. I'm like taking notes of what everyone is saying. Some like you, you won't spend your way to justice. That was phenomenal. Um, but anywho, in terms of like how we think about diversity, equity, inclusion at DoorDash, um, specifically in relation to like partnering with an and supporting the New York workforce. Um, similar to what Holly said, we think about embedding diverse DEI in everything we do, right? So DEI is not just like on an island on its own and you kind of touch it when you need it. We're making sure that it's a, it's, you know, threaded into everything we do. And so with my role specifically, I'm on the learning and development team, but I have a particular focus on women, women of all backgrounds and underrepresented talent development. Um, so I think we take a dual approach, like thinking about how we are maintaining and developing like good DEI hygiene internally. And then externally, we have, we actually recently brought on a DNI, DEI partnerships person um, who's focusing specifically on helping us scale our partnerships with organizations. To date, we have um, partnerships with organizations such as Year Up, Co2040, Management Leadership for Tomorrow, and these are all national organizations with hubs in New York, but we, we definitely have opportunity to be more intentional about how we are activating the New York communities. Um, but Oh, and I also forgot to mention the National Urban League. So there are partnerships there and they're helping us to get in front of like really incredible talent from underrepresented groups. But I look forward to kind of deepening our partnerships with more local you know, New York organizations to think about how do we activate um, folks specifically in New York City. Thank you. And B, I'd like to ask you um, a follow-up question. Um, being with DoorDash, people of color are overrepresented in temporary gig jobs. So um, how is DoorDash developing the pipeline to corporate positions? 
Absolutely. So we actually are in the, we're celebrating Black History Month, as you can tell by my background. So we've actually been hosting some events that are merchant facing to help them get the resources they need to support their, their small businesses. Um, but also we have, we have councils for the dashers. So the dashers are, um, who I presume you're re referring to. So we have a dasher council where we'll be able to kind of get insights on what what are their needs how we can best support those count our folks who are dashers and being able to design initiatives around that so we have an in-house dasher team that stays close um, to thinking about what are the needs of our dashers and how do we support that in terms of creating pathways um, to you know internal mobility i think that is something that we're still scaling out and being able to assess out what the opportunities are but I think short answer is the Dasher Council is our opportunity to making sure that we're providing support and resources and development opportunities for them. Can you share any insights that the Dasher Council has given you? Yeah, I, well, I know one insight specifically thinking about, um, there were, there was a, there was a point in time when there were some particularly black dashers were having negative experiences, right? And so the one insight there was like, okay, how do we support black dashers on the platform specifically? So being able to cultivate or take that insight and take, take basically have a bias for action from there. So they were able to convene a specific support group for black dashers. Um, so I think that's one particular initiative. I'm not too close to that body of work. Like I'm focused more on internal and in, internal learning and development, but I know that body of work is happening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so um, let's see, we have about 10 minutes or so um, to continue this moderated discussion. And then I'm going to open things up to questions. Um, I'd like to come back um, to Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock um, and really talk about as um, the city navigates its way through and beyond the pandemic, um, what are the benefits that we can actually see uh, by developing a more diverse and inclusive workforce? Like how, do our communities, but how does the whole city benefit? Well, I certainly think that um, the most visible benefit that we've seen is that um, a host of the recovery work is being done by black and brown people. Um, I can certainly say within my agency, you know, the, the, tr the heroes right now, and, and I tell them all the time, are our folks who work in our custodial space, um, the folks who are making sure that our spaces remain clean, that our elevators are running, that, um, that our spaces are prepared for a time when staff are able to return. Um, I certainly think that it has um, highlighted the importance of that work. Um, and um, certainly, you know, I, and, and I hope that someone from my agency is listening today, you know, because I certainly take my hat off to them. Um, they are working under conditions that many of us don't have to. And so one of the things that we've done really to better engage that team, and we provided the same guidance to other agencies, is really thinking about how we, through this virtual environment, can bring folks closer. Right. Um, we really want to ensure that all of our employees, um, especially those working on the front lines, um, maintain their mental resilience, but also their physical health. So we've done things like um, created um, small palm cards they can put in a wallet to remind them of EAP services because, you know, folks are dealing with a lot mentally, a lot physically. And so the Employment Assistance Program in the city of New York offers a host of services um, that they can tap into as city employees. We've also reminded them of health benefits. Um, in dire situations, we've reached out to families, we've sent wellness cards. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, um, replicate even a, a more closer environment, because I think that the pandemic has certainly had us all fully recognized that we are dealing with whole people. The days of you come across that threshold into a work environment and you leave your personal life outside, we are no longer in that time and we probably will never return to that place again. And so we're really thinking about how to take a more human centered approach to working with all of our employees, especially those who do not have the luxury of working from home and who are really supporting the city in a major way. And um, so we're talking about the pandemic's effects. It's the effects on um, frontline workers, certainly essential workers. Um, but, um, and there's also a digital divide, right? Um, so as we talk about um, growth of jobs that may be not, may be remote, right? 
um, because that's an important thing in this recovery and not being shut out of that. Um, how is the city and how is your agency uh, uh, addressing that, you know, at, at a time when, um, you know, it just seems that black and brown communities are getting left further and further behind, even like I said, with the digital divide. So we've certainly um, in one space have tried to optimize the use of technology where appropriate, but we have also returned back to, back to the basics. I mean, there was a time when you printed out flyers to share information. You shared information through word of mouth, targeted mailings. We've had to return back to some of that. And while I know that some individuals may view that as wasteful, you know, we really want to meet individuals where they are. We've also, um, strengthen a host of partnerships with community-based organizations who are working boots on the ground, faith-based organizations um, that actually know exactly where we should tap in to alert folks to jobs that are now available in the city. Um, I don't think that there's any surprise that, you know, that the city financially has, you know, suffered a bit of a downturn, but there have still been opportunities, you know, specifically because of our recovery efforts that have continued um, to be made available. So um, at the time where, um, and NYPD needed to um, really cast the widest net possible to get police communication technicians because we have more emergency calls coming in. We were out there and we work with individuals to inform them of this job and, and of the opportunities and the advancement associated with coming in at that level in the organization. So, so we tried to maximize you know, um, what we used to do <laughs> before technology um, uh, until we're in a better place as a city, but also we have um, strengthened partnerships and maximize our use of technology wherever we could in order to get the word out about just the career opportunities that still lie within the city, even during um, a time where we're all experiencing a host of challenges. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And, and speaking about those um, challenges, and I'm going to ask this of um, Tilda, um, you know, public hospitals are being squeezed um, uh, economically. Uh, and uh, as well, you know, you've got a workforce that is also um, bearing the brunt of the virus itself. Um, and then you start to talk about things like um, the vaccine and uh, unequal not only unequal access to the vaccine, but also um, higher vaccine hesitancy. So you put all of that together. I would just um, ask if you can address a little bit how these trends are affecting um, uh, diversity within your workforce. Thank you for that question. So I think there has been, you know, you know, health and hospitals has been um, at the forefront of this pandemic. And as you all know, Elmhurst Hospital, which is part of the health and hospital system, was the epicenter of the pandemic during March. Um, and, you know, the system, you know, our mission is to provide care, quality care for everyone, for, you know, without exception. Um, and we've stayed true to our mission. And, you know, thankfully, this administration has um, really been supportive both, you know, by, from a resource perspective and just being thinking about how we can innovatively address uh, many of the challenges that we face to ensure that we cared for every single individual who came through our doors. Um, and, you know, for us, you know, it created a great strain on our healthcare workers um, and inclus inclusive, right, to Zon's point, you know, those who we, you know, are, key to uh, hospital operations, environmental services, food service, transportation. So these were individuals, right? You think about doctors and nurses, but you know, we also need to recognize the unsung heroes in this space um, in the fact that there were people who had to come in, right? Because we are 24 hours, seven day a week operation to provide critical services for hospital operations. So administrative staff, you know, we were all, it was all hands on deck. Um, regardless of, you know, our roles. And sometimes we had to reinvent our roles in order for us to be able to function and ensure that we were providing care to our patients, right? So, 
you know, that was, you know, providing supportive services, like, you know, pulling up childcare services, creating lodgings, respite areas, you know, offering wellness programs, um, opportunities for people to decompress, right? Ensuring that individuals have the appropriate supplies like PPEs. There was a gamut of challenges that we faced um, as an institution. The one thing that I must say is that we all banded together and we rallied together to ensure that, you know, we were doing what we needed to do. And I always get regret when I think about where we're at, but it was true. Like we were in the midst of a pandemic and it was like, and we got together and we did whatever we needed to do to do what we had to do. But that being said, it's really important for us to really think about the fact that our workforce really is, you know, all of them are heroes in this space um, because of what they did. Um, and I forgot your other question because of course, I'm just thinking about everything that our workforce has done, and I'm so very proud. <laughs> thank you so much for, for, for all you are doing and for all our, our healthcare workers and providers are doing. Uh, it, you know, it's uh, we, the, the city went through something and it's still going through something, and I really appreciate uh, you uh, sharing that with us. Um, I, I really just uh, wanted to, you know, talk about how. Um, these trends and what you're experiencing um, uh, is affecting um, the composition of the workforce. Right. Uh, because we hear I think it's not. And I think to, your, to the question now that I remember your question in full, um, thinking about like, right, what we encountered in this space is that there's such a great disparity in how individuals across the city have been impacted by COVID. And we know, right, black and brown people have been most adversely affected by, you know, you know COVID and, you know, our highest mortality rates are in this space. Um, understanding that, um, you know, we are looking at our data and, you know, making sure that we are trying to understand, you know, you know, how we can provide services like separation, you know, isolation hotels to help people, help, you know, segregate, providing hot meals, you know, how are we helping to support individuals so that they can survive and thrive, you know, in a COVID environment. Um, and all of these programs were things that we had to kind of build out from, you know, in response to COVID. Um, and I think it's remarkable that in such a short period of time, understanding city government and how it works, right, that we were able to kind of pivot um, to our normal operations to be able to, to stand up isolation hotels for patients, employees, to create meal programs, to have systems in place, knowing that the vast majority of our population live in congregate areas that they can't safely separate. Um, due to, you know, how, you know, we're, you know, we're vertical living, you know, socioeconomics. Um, and for those reasons, we were actually be able to kind of make sure that we were caring for our patients. Um, and then we go into the conversation about vaccines and hesitancy. And what does that mean for us? And it poses a number of challenges. I mean, there's historical uh, background for why black and brown people would be hesitant to be able to be vaccinated. And that is a reality, right? And so we need to address that, recognize that there is historical mistrust of Western medicine based on historical uh, history of, you know, how black and brown people were treated in, in Western medicine and, and, and their distrust. Um, and so how are we, and so now we have to tackle that straight on. And so for us, it's really, really important for us to recognize that, which we have, and to really be able to figure out innovative solutions, whether it's you know convening in partnerships with our trusted community-based organizations, our churches, right, so that we can make sure that you know people you know are hearing it from trusted voices, that we are you know communicating correctly, we're messaging out, we're creating air, uh, these uh, hubs in neighborhoods that are traditionally immigrant people uh, of color, right? These are the things that we're working on to really make sure that we're making an impact. Thank you so much. Uh, and speaking of community-based organizations, I'd like to circle back to the um, Outside Advisory Council, uh, Holly. 
-hmm. if, you, if you can talk about that a little bit. We'd just love to get a little uh, insight in um, what are they telling you, you know, needs to happen in order to reach these goals? Well, I'll tell you, I'd, I'd like to highlight two programs that we have just launched in response, you know, for Black History Month. And, and part of this comes out of not only our desire as a, as a company to be responsive and own our responsibility for um, not only working with our suppliers, but also how are we investing in pipelines that we know are so important. So taking those two things very seriously and, and you know, our, our council is is um, very much in, involved, but um, I'm so excited to, to share our progress towards this when we meet next. So um, one program that we just launched is um, just recently within the last couple of days is the Next Tech Diversity Program. And when you think about jobs in the telecom industry and in the network infrastructure, ten, uh, black technicians only make up 10% of those roles. So what is our responsibility as a Fortune 40 company to invest in the pipeline, knowing that this is an industry with tens of thousands of open positions that offer what we spoke of earlier, that long-term lucrative careers. This is not you know, just this quick win, but how can we build these sustainable, really good careers? And so over the next five years, the Next Text Diversity Program aims to, will be providing training, placement for thousands of underrepresented candidates to take on roles in, in 5G network technicians. So when I think about how we're gonna measure this, you know, our goals, we want 90% of candidates who enter the Next Tech Diversity Program to graduate and become certified, whether it's as a field tech or whatever they choose to study in, in the technician field. More than, and we also aim for 90% or more of the candidates to be placed within jobs within 45 days. Additionally, we aim for 90% of those candidates to stay in their jobs for at least 12 months. So this is one way I think, you know, community, our, our companies in, can take ownership of the pipelines that we need to build and, and invest in, in the communities that we know we need to and seeing that need, you know, with 10% of black technicians, we, we know we can do better. And so we are going to build that pipeline. And it's not even just for T-Mobile, it's for the good of all of the industry. Is there a so, role or partnership with HBCUs in this? We do have a role with HBCUs. We have a Magenta Scholar program where we're investing in HBCUs and looking at internships um, that will result out of that. So yes, absolutely, that's part of this. The other program that we just launched is a Magenta Edge program. And I heard in the, the previous panel speaking about the impact to Black small-owned businesses that are uh, twice as likely to close their doors permanently compared to other businesses. And we know that the primary driver is the disparity for uh, long-standing systemic lack of access to resources, business loans. And so this program in Magenta Edge offers all entrepreneurs expert advice and insight in how to navigate these historical, you know, these difficult times that we're in, but through the lens of black owned small business owners and their stories. And I think that's really important. So what we're gonna be providing is free educational programming, best practices for entrepreneurs, how to address systemic barriers that black small business owners face and how to succeed. And this is just the initial phase. You know, we're looking at how can we build upon this, um, get the feedback that we need and how to expand. But these are some of the things that we're looking at and, and excited to build because we want to be part of the solution. We understand that when you have uh, black small owned businesses that are, are suffering at such a high rate, what that does to communities. And so when we think about, um, our role and our responsibility for equity and how we can leverage our resources. We find that, you know, these are just two programs that I'm really excited about. Thank you, thank you. And if you can um, park any information uh, about that in chat, and I'm going to ask our other panelists, um, as you mentioned programs, or um, if there is information of how people can connect with you. Um, I'm about to move into the Q&A portion, but when you have a moment, if you can park that in the chat, that will be appreciated. People want these takeaways. So thank you for that. And so um, my first question 
in the q a is a very simple one and i'm actually going to ask kristen if she can address this um first uh how might women and uh bipoc led startups contribute to solving the issues uh being discussed today it's a very broad question um but would love any of your insights on that yeah well, thank you for the question and thanks for the opportunity to answer. I think uh, it's not how, it's when. I think that that should be today. They should be contributing to the conversation um, because, you know, I lean into this, this quote I heard and I'll have to reference it later. Uh, we should let those who are living it share the experience, right? And so, you know, for the startups, the MWB communities, the underserved, underutilized entrepreneurs, they are the ones we want to hear from, right? That should be at the, the round tables, the advisory boards, and then connect the, the Fortune 100s, 40s of T-Mobile, DoorDash, CDW, who, who don't have, aren't disadvantaged, quite honestly. We don't have a lack of access to capital. Um, and so when we can combine those forces and have those honest conversations, um, you know, we can put a roadmap forward. So I guess I would answer directly is, to you know, seek us out and let's hear what is what, what are the hurdles, what are the barriers. We can't have a future without acknowledging a past. It, it doesn't work that way. So we need to, to understand where those hurdles are. So leaders like you know, on this panel and the leaders before us can roadmap, but also, you know, share was touched a little bit on the second panel. We're corporate alliance members uh, to the small business. Um, under Commissioner Doris, and they put out a great playbook. I think he mentioned it a little bit. It's online um, on the SBS website, and it really talks about respond, recover, and thrive. And um, as Corporate Alliance members, we align ourselves with the small business um, agency, and, and there are good resources there too. But I would just really implore who asked the question or who's thinking about that, how do I participate, um, you know, is, is to reach out and get involved. There's two ways to live life. You can be present or you can participate. And we have to participate. Is there, um, uh, within your uh, vendors, uh, is there some sort of advisory council? Like, is there a particular mechanism by which um, they can provide that kind of feedback? Yeah, you know what's some of the best part of working in New York City is there's never a lack of shyness. We get feedback all the time. Um, good, bad, it's, I'll get the most honest, how are we doing to our supplier base, right? In a, in a non-COVID, I'm there, you know, every week meeting with our supply chain. Now we're, we're meeting virtually. So there's always, even if it's not formal, we're getting the feedback um, on what's working, what could be improved. Um, and so there is formal ways through mentor, uh, mentorship programs and coaching, you know, opportunities, but it's an open dialogue because at the end of the day, we don't want our suppliers at CDW just to be successful with us. We want them to be successful so Thank that they can you. You know, scale and grow. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question um, for uh, Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock. Can you speak more about testing and how to ensure um, you're creating a diverse workforce? So maybe you can talk a little bit about the testing process for those who might be curious and, and want to enter the workforce. Well, that makes me happy that folks are interested in the yeah. test because I can, I can only tell you that when we go to recruitment events, it's a very, very hard sell when someone actually has a job there waiting for you. So I'm very happy to talk about civil service testing. So um, essentially members of my team, we come up with um, a host of exams that are tied directly to the skills um, and abilities that someone would be required to perform day one in a particular title. So as I mentioned, we have 2000 titles. So we have um, exams for public health sanitarians. Those are the folks who go around to restaurants and provide the, provide the ratings, A, B, or C, right? Hopefully you only go to the ones where they've rated A. Well, you know, we don't... <laughs> Um, but we also have secretarial exams. We have um, custodian exams. We have maintenance worker exams, heating plant technician exams. So we actually have a team that creates that test content. They work with individuals who perform the job to ensure that the, the duties and the scope of services that are provided through that job are accurate. We also have another team of SMEs, folks who perform those jobs. And we ensure that we pull in a diverse 
pool of candidates who currently sit in those positions to also take sample exams so we can make sure that this testing content is relevant and that it really uh, measures consistently against different groups that currently occupy those titles. So we also um, look at adverse impact of our exams after we administer them. Um, so we um, offer these exams on a schedule. It's on the DCAS website. I'm going to post um, our website on the chat. Um, and then what happens is after it's scored and rated, we do have an appeals process in case you want to appeal your score. Um, we have a protest period. If you want to protest the score, we allow for that. And then there's a list that's developed. And so um, individuals are then appointed by score. So, you know, no one is aware of your gender, no one's aware of your race, it's, it's by the score of that exam. And that's how people are selected to fill positions. Agencies that have vacancies would call from those lists and they would make appointments in what we call list order, which means based on your ranking. Um, and so we go through that process because we want to make sure that we um, really hold true what civil service is about. And it's supposed to be about merit and fitness. I can tell you a personal story. My, both of my parents were civil servants because as two brown people, they were unable to get a fair shot. And they saw civil service as really being that pathway towards equity that allowed them to be first time homeowners and to put my sister and I through college. So um, really, th the system is based on merit and fitness. The challenge is is that um, the lists sometimes, you know, we would have them in existence for maybe one to four years, depending on the hiring need. And so depending on what your driver is, as you're trying to go into the world of work, that may not be something that works well for you. You may want an immediate job. If that's the case, we do have 15% of our jobs are actually what we call discretionary, where you go through a traditional hiring process where you submit a resume and there's a standard interview, you have a diverse panel of people who interview you, and then you could be selected or, you know, or rejected for that particular position. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're already at 4.15. Um, what I'd love to do is uh, give everyone um, a chance, if they can, just to um, give us some parting words, uh, advice, uh, and also this is a chance, again, to plug anything that you're doing um, that you want people to know about. Um, so um, I will ask first, um, be Awe. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, I want to leave with saying thank you to you all. I just am really absorbing all the great information. Secondly, I will say is that DoorDash is hiring a lot. DoorDash is hiring in New York City. So please go to the DoorDash Careers website and start applying. We're applying. And I, what I think is most critical to understand about the technology sector is that it's not just engineering. Engineering is a core piece of it. And I think it is a wonderful thing to do if you know how to code, but don't feel like you only have to know how to code in order to be in this sector. I'm a living testament of that. And I used to work in coding schools in New York City. And I saw a lot of people doing it because they felt like they had to. So please check out DoorDash. We have a lot of incredible opportunities. And um, hopefully by virtue of what I've shared, you, you can tell that we are deeply committed to not only getting people in the door, but making sure that they're growing their careers at DoorDash. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can connect and talk more about DoorDash. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Matilda Roman. Thank you. So I would love to conclude by just sharing that New York City Health and Hospitals is a great employer. Um, we have many programs. I didn't have to give it a chance to talk about all the professional development leadership programs that we offer, scholarship programs, just to help support our employees um, to really reach their full potential. Um, and I think that you know, our mission speaks for itself. Um, and understanding you know, all the work that we've done um, and continue to do. So if interested, there are many opportunities at New York City Health and Hospitals, and we would love to have you visit our website um, to explore those opportunities. Um, and for those who are interested in receiving health services at New York City Health and Hospitals, we welcome you. Um, we have the most committed, dedicated physicians, nurses, and other allied professionals that are here to help support you um, and make you live your healthiest life. Wonderful, thank you so much. And, and, and please park it in the chat. Uh, I know that people will wanna engage you on that. Um, I'm asking now, um, Kristen Malik. 
Um, thank you so much. I, I learned so much. I, I, I like to coin myself as a relentless learner and this definitely filled my cup today and for the week. And so thank you so very much. You know, I would, I'll park things in, in the chat and I see it filling up with so many resources. And I think that's such a gift where we can continue to just pay it forward. But I guess I would end with saying or conclude is that, you know, when we look back to, to either in a month or three months or six months, whatever it is, right? Um, I think disruption has to be just common now and expected. But when we look back, I would just challenge us all to, to be able to say that we did our part. I think we have heard numerous programs, um, you know, what data is showing us, navigational direction, whatever it's going to be that you lean into, but lean into something um, so that you can say you did your part because uh, it's going to take everybody. Certainly will. And I'm gonna ask Holly Martinez now. Sure, thank you. Um, and I also wanna say that we're hiring in New York City. We are hiring, we have technology roles open right now on our website, I'll get you the link. And we also have roles in business to business that we're hiring for right now. And so really wanna make sure that, that we see that. Similar, similar to what Kristen um, said, what I, this work can feel daunting because it's an insatiable need and uh, there's so much to do and the work can feel really slow. What I find is most um, important is to really look contextually at every single issue. Um, we tend to look at it business, line of business per line of business, team by team. The, the need, the area of opportunity is so contextual. And what one line of business where their pipeline challenges may be or their development challenges may be will be very different than, than another line of business or another team. So when you think contextually, when you think through um, the opportunities, even at a small level, it helps you not be discouraged because you can see those small wins. And again, I want to thank every panelist and thank you, uh, Cheryl, for hosting this because again, all of us, we have our heads down in this work and it can feel daunting. And um, it and I'd love to see the tears on this call because this work is very personal. And um, I just wanna thank everyone here and uh, look forward to um, staying in touch with you and hearing more about the great work that you're doing. Thank you, thank you. And Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock, please um, close this out. Well, I'll close out the remarks, but if you could just close us out with your insights, it'd be wonderful. Well, Cheryl, I certainly want to thank you and City and State and all of the other esteemed panelists. I have also learned so much. I've been taking notes. Um, so anytime my eyes have not been on the cameras because I'm writing down things that you're saying, as well as your contact information. Um, what I would say is that um, New York City is a great place to work. I've worked within the city of New York at this point at five agencies for 24 years. And I never thought I was one of those folks who came into the city saying, after two years, I'm gone. But if you are someone who is interested in doing work that lives beyond you and truly contributing to the betterment of New York City and the life of New Yorkers, the city of New York is certainly the place where you should work. I also just want to quickly plug Matilda because the communication strategy that H&H &H, um, released after after the murder of George Floyd and talking about race and equity and how important it is to honor the lives of black and brown people. We borrowed so much from that really courageous strategy and that really has been incorporated into our work. So I just wanna say thank you to you and your teams. Um, and lastly, you know, our information is in the chat. Um, DCAS, we have touch points at every agency. Please reach out, reach out to me directly if you have any questions about how to navigate a civil service career. And I thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to you, to Matilda Roman, Biawe, Holly Martinez, and uh, Kristen Malik. And, and thank you to Ralph Ortega and the team at City of State for hosting this summit. I'm Cheryl huggins Salomon from the NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at mcsilver.nyu.edu. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm now going to hand it over to city and state. Thanks, Cheryl, and to all for a really great, inspiring discussion. Um, I I just want to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors once again, um, whose support is integral to the continuation of such events. Thank you to CDW, TD Bank, T-Mobile, Anshin, DoorDash, Gilbane Building Company, uh, the New York City School Construction Authority, 
Ostroff Associates, Turner Construction Company Headquarters, Battery Park City Authority, Infrastructure Engineering, Laborers Local 1010, and New York Family. Please be sure to join us at our upcoming webinars next week, starting on Tuesday, February 23rd, for our second installment of our first three coronavirus update, effects on industry, which is scheduled for 2 p.m. Registration is free and can be found in the chat. Also on Thursday, February 24th, we have our third installment focused on ranked choice voting in Manhattan uh, and some additional mayoral candidate interviews at 2 p.m. Registration is free and can be found in the chat. And finally, on Friday, February 25th, um, I think that date's wrong, actually, the 26th, right? Um, we are co-hosting with Crown Castle the economic benefits of 5G at 10 a.m. Registration is free and can be found in the chat. Thank you again for joining us and hope to see you at a future webinar. Uh, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.